Chapter 14, The Civil War. Here we are, the North and South have decided that there's no way they can exist within the same union and violence has broken out. We, we've moved beyond simple secession. Uh, the 11 states of the Confederacy have formally declared that they are no longer part of the union. Uh, and, and now with the uh, taking of Fort Sumter, there will be open warfare between the Union and uh, the Confederate States. Okay, uh, first of all, we're going to talk about the mobilization of the North. With most of the Democrats gone, uh, there are some Northern Democrats left, and we'll talk about them in just a second. Uh, but with most of the Democrats gone, the Republicans, by and large, are going to control Congress. And since they're essentially the only ones left, they're pretty much going to be able to do what they want to. They're going to pass their own agenda. And we will see that they will do things that even today are considered traditional Republican agenda items. Things like promoting economic development, uh, especially in the West, that is really where they sort of concentrate on developing the West. They raise tariffs to protect American manufacturing. Uh, they provide for railroads and a national banking system and all that good stuff. But all that aside, of course, the number one thing that they have to do is provide for the war. And the biggest thing they have to do in that sense is to pay for the war. Um, and the North provides money for the war in several different ways. Number one, they do raise taxes in order to pay for the war. They do issue paper currency, commonly known as greenbacks, because, of course, American money has a green tint to it. Uh, but by far, the biggest source of income, the biggest source of war payments, come from borrowing money. And the main source of borrowing is actually going to be from American citizens. Uh, they issue what are known as war bonds. It's kind of the idea of you pay us a certain amount of money to help us fight the war. Then after the war is over, we'll pay that back with interest. Uh, and the American people in the North really responded uh, by supporting their government and buying these war bonds. Uh, the other thing they have to do is they have to provide an army. Now, the United States did have a standing army. We have a professional permanent army, uh, but the problem was at the beginning of the Civil War, most of that army is stationed in the West. Uh, of course, uh, the, the biggest threat out West would be from Native American uh, attacks. So most of the professional army, it was a rather small army anyway. So we have a, a small permanent army, but that's mainly stationed out West. So we, they essentially have to raise an army. Now, in the early days of the war, we'll talk about this more a little bit later as well, uh, there is a lot of enthusiasm for fighting the Civil War on both sides. And, and the idea is, you know, both sides felt that they were in the right. Both sides thought that their cause was just and that they had truth and justice on their side. And really, most people thought that this war would be over in a matter of weeks. You know, there might be one or two battles, a couple of weeks, maybe a month at the most. It would clear the air. Their side would obviously be proven right, and then we'd all go back to life as normal. We know, looking back on it through history, that was not destined to be the case. So initially, people are very enthusiastic to sign up and prove that their side is right. Uh, but as the war drags on and the casualties begin to mount, people begin to realize this is not going to be over in a few weeks, and they lose that initial enthusiasm. And eventually, the North will have to start a draft. They will have to force people to fight. And that is not very well received at all. In fact, there are draft riots in major cities uh, where, where people physically, uh, physically refuse to, to sign up for this war. Now, we do need to talk about Abraham Lincoln as president. And, and you know, historians love to rank things, right? And every so often... You will see somebody publish a list, you know, the, the best U.S. presidents ranked best to least or whatever. Uh, and, and without doubt, Abraham Lincoln is always in, he's, you know, usually the, the top five easily. You know, there's always Lincoln. George Washington, of course, is usually up there. Uh, usually Thomas Jefferson's pretty high. Franklin Roosevelt usually does pretty well. Uh, but Lincoln, you can bet Lincoln's going to be probably one, two, or three. Uh, Lincoln was uh, an amazing man, uh, and sometimes just through sheer force of will, he, he kept the Union together. 
But I do want you to know that Lincoln makes some pretty bold moves as president. In fact, some of the things he does it, are in violation of the Constitution. And he knows this. And his argument is, why follow the Constitution to the letter of the law if by doing that you lose the Constitution? If by following the Constitution to the letter of the law and the United States is destroyed, what was the purpose of following the Constitution? So his argument is, I broke the Constitution to save the Constitution. So, you know, that, that's definitely an interesting argument. But things like, for example, he sent troops into battle. Now today, it, it's pretty much a settled piece of uh, American policy that, yes, as Commander-in-Chief, the U.S. President has the authority to send troops into battle, even without a declaration of war from Congress. And that's, as a side note, that's actually an important distinction. Congress never declares war in the Civil War. And the reason for that is, it is always, from the Northern point of view, it's never a formal war between two separate countries. According to Lincoln, the Civil War is always about putting down a rebellion. It's not a war between the United States of America and the Confederate States of America, two separate countries. It's, the, it's a war in the United States that's really putting down a rebellion. And that's actually something important. We'll talk about that on the next slide. But that is an important legal and technical distinction. The Civil War is not a declared war by Congress. So anyway, back, back to the uh, original point. He is the, one of the first, I don't know if he's the first, but he is definitely one of the first true, uh, American president to send troops into battle without a declaration of war of Congress. And again, today, that's settled law, that that is okay. Back then, it was definitely not. The other thing that he did was he increased the size of the army. And the reason why that is important is because the more soldiers you have, the more you have to pay them. And the thing with that is, according to the Constitution, no money can be spent unless it's authorized by Congress. Well, Congress did not, you know, th this was something that happened essentially overnight. It's a very fast-moving situation, and Lincoln did not want to sit around and wait for Congress to debate and pass a law authorizing the, the increased size of the army. So he just did it. And again, that's in a very gray area because only Congress can authorize the spending of money. And he essentially said, we have these troops, now we have to pay them. And he did not ask Congress's permission first. And the other thing he did was that he instituted a blockade of the South. Uh, we'll talk about this later. The South essentially has no Navy. And so Lincoln uses the United States Navy to cut the South off from the rest of the world. Um, and again, in times of rebellion, that, that may be allowed, it may not be allowed. That's a very gray area of the law. Now, in, in terms of effectiveness, that is probably what won the war for the North, the fact that the South could not get any help from other countries. Uh, so it was a very effective move, but the legality of it is something that's definitely in a gray area. Uh, probably the biggest problem to the Civil War, to the North during the Civil War, is the opposition to the war. Because there are a lot of people in the North, especially as the war drags on, who don't want to fight it. Uh, there are a lot of people who are willing to say, let the South go off and do their own thing. Um, and by and large, these people are led by the Peace Democrats. There are still Northern Democrats around, um, even though they are in the distinct minority these days. There are some people who identify as Northern Democrats. Now, they have a special name. Uh, by and large, they are going to be referred to as a copperhead. And of course, as you probably know, a copperhead's a type of snake. And so this nickname of Copperheads, that was not a, a nice nickname. They were essentially saying, here are these people who are sort of waiting in the grass, just waiting to strike and, and harm the Union. So it was not necessarily a, a nice name, but they are the ones who led the opposition to the war. You also have the war Democrats who were okay with saying, yes, the South should not have seceded. Uh, it's not legal for them to do so. They should not have used force to, to take these uh, federal properties. And so, yes, it's okay to use violent measures against them. War is okay, but they are not, uh, they're not happy about emancipation. They're not happy about the draft. Um, they're, they're not happy about the ideas about slavery. So they're, they're willing to say that war is justified because of the Southern actions. But 
you know, maybe the South has good arguments too. So you have the Peace Democrats and you have the War Democrats. Now, one of the things that Lincoln does in order to deal with these dissenters, he is going to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, the writ of habeas, habeas corpus is a Latin phrase that literally means produce the body. The writ of habeas corpus is a constitutional right which says that an American citizen has his day in court, essentially. That if you are arrested for a crime, you have the right to stand before a judge and be told what that crime is and to be judged guilty or innocent and then do your time. It protects against being thrown in jail and just being left there to rot. That's what the writ of happiest corpus protects against. The United States government does not have the authority to simply throw you in jail and leave you there uh, without you having your day in court. Well, the Constitution guarantees that right, but it also says that during times of rebellion, the president can suspend the writ of habeas corpus, and that's exactly what Lincoln does. Uh, more than 13,000 people over the course of the Civil War are going to be arrested. Uh, newspaper editors that ride against the Northern effort, Democrats, war protesters, these are people that are all essentially going to be arrested and thrown in jail and left there until the war is over. Now, that, that's where that distinction comes in. In times of war, the president is not allowed to do that. In times of rebellion, he is. And so that's why it was always an important legal distinction that the North did not view this as a war between two countries. It was just putting down a rebellion in the South. Um, and he, he does go even further. Uh, the Supreme Court, uh, famous court case, Ex parte Milligan, essentially what Lincoln was doing, what the Northern government was doing was... Uh, establishing military tribunals for civilian actions. And the Supreme Court came back and said you can't do that if the civilian courts are still operating, which they were. If the civilian courts are still operating, the civilians have to go through the civilian court. Military personnel have to go through the military courts. Well, they were putting civilians through the military court. The Supreme Court came back and said you can't do that. And he essentially ignores the Supreme Court and does whatever he wants to. And that's the thing. We, we've spoken about that before with Andrew Jackson, uh, with the, the Indian removal question. You know, the famous quote from Jackson, uh, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him uh, enforce it. The Supreme Court can do nothing on their own. It is up to the president to enforce the laws of the country. And if the, if the president wants to ignore the Supreme Court, it may not be legal, but there's not a whole lot the Supreme Court can do about it. They don't have a, a police force of their own to make sure their judgments are enforced. So anyway, uh, again, Lincoln makes some pretty bold moves. He's, he's willing to do uh, pretty much whatever it takes to win this war uh, because, again, he knows that the, uh, the alternative is the destruction of the United States. And as a whole, we will see that the Civil War represents a huge growth in the power of the presidency, not just the presidency, but the, the federal government as a whole. And we have actually seen this within our own lifetimes. Um, during times of great national crisis, people look to the president and the federal government for guidance. And really, you know, looking back through history, there have been, there have been several times that we see huge growth in the power of the presidency. We, we saw it with George Washington simply because he was first. Um, you see it with Abraham Lincoln because he has to deal with the Civil War. You see it with Franklin Roosevelt because he has to deal with the Great Depression and World War II. And I think probably the fourth time would be after 9-11. And, and that's what I meant when we've seen this in our own lifetimes. Because after 9-11, uh, the federal government and George W. Bush uh, took some pretty big liberties with federal power. It, and they, you know, really, they got away with some stuff because people were saying, okay, we have a crisis. We need somebody strong in charge. You do what you need to do to take care of the problem. Uh, and that, that's what happens with Lincoln. People are willing to let him do these gray area sort of things because they want a strong leader who's going to take care of them. Now, the thing about it is, after the crisis is over, do you think people willingly give up the power that has been granted to them? <laughs> no. And so it always just kind of builds on it. You know, you, you, you give them, you know, stop taking three steps forward and maybe one step back, right? Uh, once they grow accustomed to that power, it's very, 
very difficult for the federal government to give that power up. Uh, I do want to talk about Lincoln's re-election very quickly. Uh, he does run for re-election in 1864. Uh, he is, of course, going to run on the Republican ticket, and he's going to run against uh, McClellan, who is actually a former general of his. McClellan is going to be one of the early generals in charge of the war. Uh, he and Lincoln do not get along, and he's going to run for the Peace Democrats. And I do want you to know that his re-election was kind of shaky. It was never a foregone conclusion that Lincoln would obviously win re-election and continue to lead the United States in times of war, uh, because there for a long time, uh, a lot of people were not happy with his leadership. Uh, and as he, he, he essentially got lucky, because as we got closer to re-election time, the North won a series of battles and some other things happened to convince people that Lincoln was okay. But if he had not won re-election, you know, the United States history could be very, very different. One of the things that uh, will help sway his re-election will be emancipation. The United States during the Civil War is, th this is a watershed event, okay? Nothing is the same before the war as it is after the war. Uh, the Civil War touches all facets of American life, but of course, by far, the biggest change is probably going to be about slavery. And I want you to write this down, underline it, circle it, star it, whatever. In the beginning, the war is not about slavery. And Lincoln does not say, let's go to war to get rid of slavery. Now, that, that's always been a goal of the Republican Party. But in the early days, the, 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 uh, the cause of slavery is going to be downplayed. It's about the struggle for free labor, that we need to provide avenues for people to better themselves in the South. It's about keeping the Union whole. It's not about slavery. And in fact, we've already mentioned Senator Crittenden's proposal. Uh, he came up with a constitutional amendment that would have protected the status of slavery in order to keep the Union whole. And there were a lot of people that were in favor of it, okay? Um, but the war in the early days is not about getting rid of slavery. As a matter of fact, uh, as evidence to this, there are actually four slave states, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland, four slave states never leave the Union, okay? The, these border slave states uh, remain loyal to the Union, and Lincoln is very, very careful not to step on their toes. Uh, he knows that if he loses four more states to the Confederacy, that he's going to have major problems. So there are actually four slave states that stay with the Union during the entire Civil War. Um, and even the Republicans themselves are divided on this issue of slavery, on the issue of equal rights. And so I want you to know, again, the Civil War, right off the bat, is not about slavery. However, as the war goes on, most people begin to realize that slavery is the foundation of the South. Uh, it is the cornerstone of the Southern society, and people realize that if they want to change the South, slavery is going to have to be uh, dealt with. Um, and so as time goes on, as the war goes on, it's going to be more and more about slavery. For example, the Confiscation Act of 1861, uh, the Confiscation Act of 1862, uh, outlawing of slavery in Washington, D.C. All these things begin to chip away at the idea of slavery. Uh, but it's not until 1863 that we see the big one. Uh, that's when Abraham Lincoln issues the Emancipation Proclamation. Now, remember remember when I said Lincoln was a moderate, okay? And in all honesty, I don't think Lincoln really wanted to deal with slavery. I, I think he kind of wanted to leave it until the war was over, but he was facing a lot of pressure from radical Republicans. Um, and, and he felt that he had to do something to, to keep people happy. Now, here's the deal with the Emancipation Proclamation. On the day it was signed, the Emancipation Proclamation is the most useless document in American history. And here's why. This is what the Emancipation Proclamation says. All slaves in areas still under Confederate control were freed. 
Think about that for a second. The Emancipation Proclamation does, you know, that, that it's kind of the pat answer. What does the Emancipation Proclamation do? Oh, well, it got rid of slavery in the United States. That is not true. The Emancipation Proclamation did not get rid of slavery in the United States. What it did, it freed all the slaves in areas still under Confederate control. If you were a slave in one of the four loyal border states, it did nothing for you. Slavery was legal in those four states throughout the entire war. If you were a slave in an area, a southern area that had already been captured by Union forces, it did nothing for you. The only thing it did, it freed all slaves in areas under Confederate control. And of course, if you were a slave in an area under Confederate control, is the Confederacy going to listen to a law passed by the United States president? No, absolutely not. And so the only thing that happened was, as those areas eventually were captured by the Union forces, then you would be freed. But on the day it was signed, the Emancipation Proclamation didn't do a whole lot. Except, this is what turns the corner on the slavery issue. Because with the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, the war is now definitely about slavery, without a doubt, um, without a doubt. Now, as far as minorities in the North, for slaves, it had always been about uh, emancipation. That, that was never an issue. Slaves always saw it as their, their, their struggle for freedom. Uh, black participation in the war in the North uh, it, it really kind of varied. At first, remember, abolition is not, you know, uh, equal rights. A lot of people thought that slavery should be freed, that, that slaves should be freed, and yet they, they did not have a place in American society. So we actually see, even though black people want to sign up to fight for the North, uh, they're refused because white soldiers don't want to serve with them. Uh, however, after the emancipation, that begins to change. Uh, and, and many more African Americans do begin to serve in the Army and Navy. Over 200,000 African Americans are going to serve before the war is over. Uh, many of them freed slaves. Uh, as the Union moved into the South and captured these uh, areas and freed the slaves, a lot of those slaves turned around and signed up to fight for the Army that had just freed them. Um, e even though they do face uh, obstacles serving in the armed forces, especially in the army. Uh, segregation was, was rampant. Uh, they, they were forced to serve in all, all black units. They received lower pay. Uh, and, and even though there were some combat units, uh, most African Americans that served in the war uh, had uh, you know, menial jobs. They were the cooks or the quartermasters or things of that nature. Um, and of course, you, you have to understand that just being willing to serve at all was an act of extreme bravery uh, for these people because if they were captured by Southern forces, at, at the very best, you know, you would be sold back into slavery. At worst, you, know, you, you would face outright execution if you were captured. So just the fact that they were willing to serve at all, you know, that, that, it's amazing. They, they knew what they were getting into. They knew that they faced prejudice. They knew that they faced worse conditions than white soldiers, lower pay, worse jobs, and yet they, they turned around and they signed up by the hundreds of thousands uh, with, with much worse uh, repercussions if they were captured. Uh, it's just a, an amazing testament to the bravery of those men. Uh, as far as women, uh, it's the same deal as always. As the men go off to war, it opens up opportunities for women to, to take uh, those leadership positions, whether that's in uh, businesses or in households or whatever. They do uh, help out with the war effort. Uh, they raise money for the war effort. Uh, nursing, of course. Uh, Clara Barton rose to fame during the Civil War, the, the American Red Cross. Um, and, you know, after the war is over, they, you know, it's two steps forward and one step back sort of deal. Uh, they, they lose some of those advances, but all in all, it is a strengthening experience uh, for women. Now, I do want to talk about this idea of the quote-unquote second American Revolution. Because what we see come out of the Civil War, especially in the North, is a new definition of freedom. Uh, 
In the North, freedom really meant the opportunity to enjoy the fruits of your labor. In the South, it really meant the opportunity to dispose of your property how you wish. And of course, again, under the law, slaves are considered property. Um, and of course, with the Northern victory, that's, that's the definition of freedom that's going to be adopted. Uh, also, we see that the Civil War is part of nation building in the United States. It really solidifies what it means to become, uh, what it means to be an American. And this is represented the best in the, the Gettysburg Address. All men are created equal, new birth of freedom, government of the people, by the people, for the people. Um, it, it, uh, being an American is no longer determined by the color of your skin, essentially. It is determined by these political and philosophical beliefs that you hold dear. And of course, I know we will deal with racism. We're still dealing with racism, um, but it, it, at least it's a start. Uh, we do see new economic development in the North, and that's partially due to the dominance of the Republicans. Uh, but it's also due to the need to provide for the war effort itself. You know, we we need um, we need factories to to build these guns and cannon and to to sew the uniforms and to cook the food and so forth and so on. Uh, wars are horrible, destructive of events, right? Uh, death and destruction. But there are also boosts to the economy because all these war materials have to be provided. So uh, that, that is one thing that happens in the North is that the economy does get a boost uh, because of the Republicans and because of the war effort. We see things like the Homestead Act, uh, which grants land out west. This is one of those free soiler ideas where the United States government essentially says, uh, we will give you 100, and, I think it's 160 acres of land for free if you live on it for a number of years and if you plant crops and build buildings and put up fences and things of this nature, we'll, we'll give you the land for free just to promote development. Uh, we do see the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad, again, the, the brainchild of Stephen Douglas. It, it does eventually come to completion. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, there is a huge growth in the federal government. It's during the Civil War that the federal government actually becomes the nation's largest employer. Okay, and all that's about the North. Let's talk about the South. Um, what we see is the Confederate Constitution is actually going to be very similar uh, to the United States Constitution, except that, of course, it does provide for the, number one, sovereignty of states. It answers the question, who's going to be more in control, the state governments or the federal government? Well, in the North, we know it was the federal government. In the South, we will see it will be the state's government. Uh, states' rights is a great big deal uh, to the South. And, of course, it does provide for the existence of slavery. Uh, Jefferson Davis will be the first, and as it turns out, only president of the Confederate States of America. And as a former Secretary of War, uh, a man that has served as a soldier himself, you would think that he would be the, the best kind of leader uh, during times of war, but as it turns out, he's not a very good president. Uh, he's an okay administrator, but as it turns out, He's not a great leader, and we, we've seen this before in American history. You know, George Washington was an amazing leader of men, uh, but he wasn't necessarily the, the, the best general we've ever had. Uh, Jefferson Davis was a, a competent administrator, but he was he was very difficult to uh, to connect with. He was stubborn. He didn't have a great sense of humor. He was unable to communicate with with the common man. Um, and, and that was his big issue. He, you know, sitting behind a desk, he might have been a, a great advisor, uh, but he was, he was not the man to lead the Confederacy. Uh, there are no real political parties. You know, you would think pretty much everybody in the South is a Democrat. Of course, there are no Republicans. So you think with everybody being a Democrat, everybody would get along and be on the same page. And as it turns out, not so much. Uh, there are still lots of infighting over how to direct the war. Um, it's it's really it's it's not it's not good. Uh, like the North in the early days, there are many volunteers who want to fight the war, but as the time goes on, uh, they also have to call for a draft, and again, it's not very successful. Uh, and one of the reasons that 
the draft is unsuccessful is because of poor whites. Uh, again, the majority of people in the South do not own slaves. And as the war goes on, people begin asking themselves, why are we fighting this war? Why are we dying to preserve a way of life that really does not benefit us? Um, and to add insult to injury, uh, many plantation owners and their families were excused from fighting this war. Uh, you could pay a certain amount of money and, and escape the draft, which was not an option for poor people. And so they see the plantation owners uh, not having to sacrifice for this war, and they do, and that makes people upset. Uh, but by far, the greatest source of division is the idea of states' rights. Um, and again, states' rights is this idea, and you, know, you still hear it being spoken about today. States' rights is the idea that the states should have superiority over the federal government. And so what we see is that the states of the Confederacy will resist all attempts at any sort of national authority. And that's really why the Confederacy loses. Uh, the states all want to go on under their own way. And under the idea of states' rights, the idea that no central government could tell them what to do, even if it meant losing the war. And the case in point, uh, there is no real army of the Confederacy. What happens is, all the different states put their own armies into the field. So you have the Army of Virginia, and you have the Army of South Carolina, and they each have their own individual leaders, and they might all kind of coordinate their, their strategy, but there's no one overall person directing the efforts. And that, that's the issue, because uh, Arkansas wants to do its own thing, South Carolina wants to do its own thing, t uh, you know, uh, Virginia wants to do its own thing, and that, that's, that is what really brings the Confederacy down, is they can't get all on the same page. And there's nobody with the authority to tell them all what to do. Now, of course, uh, the South is going to struggle economically. Um, the, the war is going to devastate the South. Uh, because think about what Southerners had invested in for decades leading up to the war. Uh, they didn't build factories, they didn't build railroads, what they did with their money, and there was a lot of money in the South. They bought more land, and they bought more slaves, both of which were things they lost during the war. The, the land was physically uh, torn up and destroyed, and of course they lost their slaves over the course of the war. Um, the war was fought mainly in the South, with a few notable exceptions. Uh, they, they bore all the brunt of the destruction and the physical devastation. Uh, because of the northern blockade, they were unable to sell their cotton overseas. Remember, their biggest customer was England and their textile mills. And since they can no longer sell their cotton, uh, they couldn't get money for it. And you can't fight a war with cotton, right? Uh, at least northern factories, you know, if you used to make, I don't know, women's dresses, now you can convert that over to sewing uniforms for, uh, for the army, you know, something like that. Um, but north, I mean, South can't do a whole lot with bales of cotton. Money was pretty much impossible to come by for the South. Remember, there are no banks in the South. Uh, the Confederacy also had to issue paper currency, uh, and unlike the, the North, this was a huge disaster. And again, part of it was states' rights, because every state had their own currency. And it's actually kind of neat. I always enjoyed, as a kid, we would go to, you know, Civil War battlefields. And in the gift shops, you could always buy a replica Confederate money. And, you know, it, it's, it's colorful and it's pretty. And you've got, you know, dollar bills from Arkansas and you've got dollar bills from Alabama and so forth and so on. But the problem with that is, is that it's hard to, you know, how much is an Arkansas dollar worth compared to a Virginia dollar? There's no uniform currency. And that's, that's a major problem. Uh, another thing that we see, another problem, is that maybe not large numbers, but at least several uh, Southerners fought for the North. These these closet Unionists, um, you know, maybe they didn't own slaves, maybe they are more isolated, and so they don't feel connected to Southern society. Um, you don't really see a lot of Northerners fighting for the South, but you do see several Southerners fighting for the North. Uh, minorities in the South, just like in the North, uh, and probably to a greater extent than we see in the North, women are going to play roles during the Civil War. With the men off to war, it's up to the women 
to run the plantations and slaves. And since there is a, the South has a smaller population by this time, it, it, proportionally it's going to fall more on the women to provide for the war. Um, in fact, that, that's one of the main struggles the South has, is putting armies in the field because they simply don't have, they, they don't have the numbers of men uh, that the North does, that, and they're, they're losing more men as time goes on. And so actually by the end of the war, talking about black participation during the war, um, there was actually a, uh, a plan put forth to actually arm the slaves and send them to fight the North. Now, obviously, that seems crazy, but that is how desperate they were uh, that they were actually considering giving the uh, slaves weapons to, to go fight this war on their behalf. Now, that never actually happened. The, the war ended uh, before that could occur. But anyway, that's just some of the crazy stuff that they really kind of contemplated. Now, talking about strategy and diplomacy, uh, at least on the northern side, Really, the initiative for the war uh, lay with the North. Obviously, Lincoln is going to be the greatest, uh, the most important leader in the North. And from day one, Lincoln really sort of had the strategy uh, that he wanted to use in the war. He knew that the numbers were on his side. It's just like the American Revolution, uh, albeit with a very different outcome. Uh, the North has a higher population. They have more money. They have more factories. They have more railroads. Every conceivable resource uh, the North had the advantage of. And Lincoln realizes this. And he, he knows that he has to destroy the ability of the South to wage war. And what that means is uh, he has to destroy the Southern armies. If he can destroy the Southern armies, the, the war is over. It's not enough to just take over the South. He doesn't want to occupy the South. He has to destroy the Confederate armies. Beyond that, Lincoln will go through a series of generals because he's never happy with his military leadership. Uh, he, he won't find Ulysses Grant until 1864 when the war is, is nearly over. Um, and to be quite honest, the, the leaders that he is dealing with, they're, they're not prepared to handle a war in this size and scope. So Lincoln is by far the most important commander in the North. The rest of his generals are not that great. Now, Lincoln also has to deal with Congress. Uh, the Committee on the Conduct of the War is a congressional committee that in American history by far is the strongest voice Congress has ever had in directing a war. And, and Congress will be dominated by radical Republicans. And so as a moderate, Lincoln is always sort of butting heads against his Congress because they want a greater say on how the war is being uh, driven, and he is unwilling to, to grant that. Uh, the most important commander in the South is going to be Jefferson Davis, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, he's not the most effective president. He doesn't have an effective command system in place. Now, and you, you still hear people talk about this today, uh, we do have who's regarded as the best general in the United States during the war, uh, Robert E. Lee. Uh, Robert E. Lee was a former commander at West Point, and as a matter of fact, in the early days of the war, Abraham Lincoln went to Lee and asked him to uh, command the armies of the North. That, that is how great his respect was, uh, that he was widely regarded as the best commander. Um, but he, he refused. Uh, Lee was a native Virginian, and even if he didn't feel that strongly about slavery. I, I don't think that he was passionate about the idea of slavery. Um, he would not abandon his home state. Uh, at the lower levels, the armies are, are essentially the same, usually made up of the, the poor people of the United States. Um, and the, the big difference is uh, the North won overwhelmingly at sea because the South essentially had no navy. Now, the Southern strategy uh, is simply to survive. And they figure if they can drag this war out, uh, the longer the war goes on, the less popular it becomes, and the more people are going to uh, press for a peace treaty. So that, that's the Southern aim. They just have to survive. Like I say, the real initiative for the war lay with the North. The South just wants to survive and drag this war out as long as possible, but they know that they are going to need help. Uh, that they realize that, again, the material 
uh, you know, just on paper, the, the material benefits, the material advantages lay with the North overwhelmingly. So they have to have somebody uh, with France. It's just, just like the American colonies in the revolution, uh, the, the colonies knew that they were going to have to have friends in order to beat the British. Well, we actually turn to the same place, and that's Europe. And initially, European countries are very sympathetic to the South. Because number one, uh, England especially wants access to southern cotton, and number two, it's in their best interests to see the United States split. Uh, they know the United States is growing into a powerful country, and they see that as a competition, right? They, they see the United States as a rival, and if the United States can be split down the middle, that's better for England and France in the long run. So they, they are okay with a weak U.S. The problem is, France would not do anything without the okay of England. But they were going to follow England's lead. And England, even though they wanted access to southern cotton, they're not willing to get involved. And so nobody's going to pick a side. Uh, the South counters with what they call King Cotton Diplomacy. The, the South essentially said, well, if you won't help us, we won't help you. And so they decided not to sell any cotton to Great Britain. And the idea was that if they didn't have access to southern cotton, then their factories would have to shut down. And since the textile mills uh, employed huge numbers of people, those people would lose their jobs and they would voice their dissatisfaction to the English government. And that would force the English government to come out on the side of the South. And this doesn't work. Uh, number one, all of this southern cotton they've been buying over the years, number one, they have stockpiles that they can use for at least a little while. And they can get enough from other sources in the world, such as Egypt and India, both parts of the British Empire, uh, that they don't need southern cotton, at least temporarily. So for those reasons, uh, they don't really feel the sting uh, that the southerners hoped they would, and King Cotton diplomacy does not work. Now, I do want you to know that in many ways, the Civil War is the first modern war. For example, uh, it's the first war really in world history where the railroads were used in a military fashion. They're used for moving supplies around. They're used for troop movements. They become strategic targets of other armies. Um, it's, it's the first war that railroads are extensively used, and along with that, telegraphs. Um, you know, Previously, you had to wait days or maybe even weeks to learn what was happening on the other side of the country, right? Uh, you didn't know the outcome of the battle, and so you didn't know how to respond to it. But now, within a matter of hours, uh, you can learn what's going on. It's the first war that uses ironclad battleships. Now, these, uh, these are not modern steel warships. These are wooden warships that are covered in iron plates. But, you know, they're the forerunners of modern-day warships. Uh, the Merrimack and the Monitor, let's see, the Monitor was the Union ship and the Merrimack was the Confederate ship. And this was, this made newspaper headlines all over the world uh, when these two ships first met in battle uh, with the, the Monitor winning. Uh, we see a revolution in arms manufacturing, the first modern repeating rifles, uh, the use of artillery in warfare, um, and really, this, this leads to a new strategy. You know, when you've seen movies uh, about, you know, the Revolutionary War and things like that, and armies used to fight, you know, you'd go get two armies, they'd march to a big field, they'd la line up uh, against, you know, uh, across from one another and just start shooting, right? Well, when you're using muskets that are not that powerful and not that accurate, you can fight wars like that. But if you use modern repeating rifles that are much more accurate, much more powerful, and you can fire much more quickly, if you line up across an open field and just start shooting, that's going to be a bloodbath. And that's what they learned during the early days of the war, that they could not fight these wars in the traditional manner. And so they had to come up with some way of giving their troops cover. And we will see that will be the advent of trench warfare. Uh, trenches, of course, are these big giant ditches that you can uh, duck down in and then you pop up, shoot a few shots, and then duck down again. And the problem with this is, is that trench warfare is, uh, is slow, you know. Uh, 
you, you get two trenches dug opposing one another, and you might move a few yards in one direction, you might move a few yards in the other direction, but once you settle into that stalemate, all that happens over the days is more and more people die. Um, but it's exactly what happens in World War I. And as we will see, that medicine is not going to be up to the task of, of saving these lives. And so even if you weren't killed outright, even if you were wounded, that was almost as good as a death sentence. Uh, one of the reasons we see such high uh, fatality numbers in the Civil War, disease kills more men than combat, especially in prison camps. And so eventually, it, it, it literally gets to the point where, say, you're shot in the arm. And even though the, the wound itself may not be life-threatening, the risk of infection is so great that they, they would literally just go ahead and cut your arm off um, because there was nothing else they could do. Um, and you see, uh, well, I don't know how we're going to it. Um, it's also the first use of propaganda. Uh, photography was extensive during uh, the Civil War. Uh, both sides used propaganda to mobilize public opinion um, and, and really, as people begin sending photographs back from the front lines, uh, Matthew Brady is a famous Civil War era photographer. As these pictures are being printed in newspapers, and really for most people, this is the first time they've ever seen the effects of war. You know, it's one thing to read these accounts where, you know, a thousand men died in this battle the other day. And then it's another thing to open up the newspaper and there's a picture of that, right? And so the use of photography is very, uh, very big. It's one of the, the main things about the Civil War. All right, let's talk about the actual battles. We're not going to go just incredibly in depth in this, but I do want you to know how the war kind of unfolds and what some of the major battles are. In the beginning of the war, it's mainly concentrated between the land, uh, between the two capitals, which will be uh, Richmond and Washington, D.C., and really, you know, on a map, uh, the distance between Richmond and Washington, not not that much. Uh, they're, they're actually fairly close, geographically speaking. Uh, the war actually began with the Battle of Bull Run in July 1861. Uh, and it really was sort of a crazy picture. Remember, this is during the, the early days of the war where a lot of people are uh, anticipating a, a short, relative, a relatively bloodless war one or two battles, we'll get this sorted out, and then we'll go about our lives. Um, people, people treat this like a social event. Uh, they come out to the hills surrounding uh, the, the, the battleground to, to watch the battle take place. They pack picnic lunches. Um, it, it's really kind of a, a bizarre time. Uh, and what happens is it is a southern victory. Uh, the northern forces are not prepared. Uh, they end up in kind of a chaotic retreat, and it actually a lot of the Civil War historians think that if the South had just continued on and continued pressing the North further, uh, they actually might have ended things then and there, and it might have been a relatively short war, uh, but they stopped and they allowed the, the Northern forces to retreat and regroup, and people realized after the Battle of Bull Run, this is not going to be a quick and easy victory because more men died there than any battle in American history up to that point, and people realized this is not going to be a relatively uh, bloodless war. After that, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot more happening early on in the East. Uh, McClellan, uh, who I mentioned earlier, will be the uh, early Union commander. He's going to invade Virginia, but he's turned back at the Second Battle of Bull Run. After that, Lee's going to invade the North um, at the Battle of Antietam, uh, which technically is a Union victory, um, but more Americans died at Antietam than, than any other day in American history. Uh, the North tried to invade Virginia again, and they were thrown back at Fredericksburg. So you can see it's kind of back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the North will try to invade the South, and they're turned back. The, the South will try to invade the North, and they're turned back. The North will try to, and they're turned back. And so it's, in the East, it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. The really important stuff is happening out West. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that that is where Ulysses S. Grant is making a name for himself. Uh, and he, of course, will eventually become uh, regarded as the finest general for the Union. Uh, 1862, 
uh, the North captures New Orleans, and this is huge. You know, th this is almost one of those things that the South will will never be able to recover from. New Orleans is the largest city in the South. It's the busiest port in the South. It controls access to the Mississippi River. Uh, if you control the Mississippi River, you pretty much split the Confederacy right in two. Um, this is this is a devastating blow for the Confederate States. Uh, it, and again, it's something that they are not going to be able to recover from. Uh, we see the Battle of Shiloh in 1862, which is a Union victory. Um, so in in the, in the West, the Union is doing fairly well. Uh, after Shiloh, things kind of bog down, and things are not going so great out east either. Uh, McClellan is too hesitant. The, the big problem with McClellan is he is unwilling to fight a battle unless he knows he's going to win. Uh, unless he just has an overwhelming advantage, he's not really interested in starting a fight he may not win. Um, and so he was really seen as being too cautious and too hesitant. Uh, and as we will see, that 1863 is going to be the turning point in the Civil War. Uh, the Battle of Chancellorsville is a is actually it's a Confederate victory, and it's notable because the Confederate forces are vastly outnumbered. They really had no business winning this battle, but they do. But in many ways, it's a loss because Robert E. Lee loses his most uh, able assistant, Stonewall, Thomas Stonewall Jackson, is actually going to be killed at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, he's actually going to be killed by friendly fire. He's returning to a Confederate camp, and one of the guards didn't know who he was, and he opened fire, uh, and the, the wounds became infected, and, and Jackson later died. Um, and this is a tremendous blow to Lee, because he was kind of his right-hand man. And after this, uh, Lee sees the writing on the wall. By 1863, the war is not going that great for the South. Everybody knows this. And so Lee really figures he has, he's got one shot to turn this war around, and he's going to risk it all on invading the North. And the, the, the South really hadn't done that. Remember, the South is fighting a defensive war. They're not interested in invading the North. You know, aside from the very early days of the war, they're not really concerned with invading the North. They're just trying to survive. Well, Lee decides if he can invade the North and put them on the defensive and give the Southern forces, you know, some time to, to regroup, that that's going to be the only thing that's going to save the South. So essentially, this is a, a, an all or nothing gamble. He's going to risk it all on an invasion of the North, and he chooses Gettysburg, uh, Pennsylvania, to, to launch his invasion. And so the, the, the roles are kind of reversed. Usually Lee is used to fighting a defensive war, and now he's going to be taking on the role of the aggressor, and he's going to be attacking these entrenched forces. And as we all know, Gettysburg will be the largest battle ever fought on the North American continent. Uh, just extreme devastation and, and death result from this battle. Um, and it is going to be a devastating defeat from the, for the South. The South will never recover from Gettysburg uh, and will never really threaten the North ever again. And at the same time that they're losing Gettysburg, uh, they're also going to lose Vicksburg, which is one of their last strongholds. Um, and, you know, it's, it's all downhill from there. By 1864, Grant is in charge. And again, he, he is on page with Lincoln. He wants to overwhelm the South, and if that means that he loses some people in the process, he's willing to do that. He's he's willing to sacrifice his troops and materials uh, because, again, he knows that he has numbers on his side. Uh, William Tecumseh Sherman uh, begins his famous march to the sea. He captures Atlanta, then marches to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, essentially, he... He, he burns he burns the land between Atlanta and the, the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, as he puts it, war is hell. And he's trying to prove to the Southerners that if you continue to resist, this is what's going to happen. You, you are going to lose everything if you continue to resist because we're, we're going to destroy it all. Um, the, the final blow comes in April of 1865. The southern capital of Richmond is captured. Um, and that's, that's it. Uh, 
April 9, 1865, Lee realizes that any any further uh, anything else is, is just going to cost needless lives. He realizes there's no way that the, the South can win this war. And so at uh, Appomattox Courthouse, which is a, the name of a town, it's not a, an actual building, uh, Appomattox Courthouse, Lee meets Grant and he surrenders his army. Now, I do want you to realize, again, because of the very decentralized nature of the South, just because Lee surrenders doesn't mean the war is over because there are other armies still out in the field, but Lee commanded the largest army, and without his army, there definitely was no way that the South could win. So essentially, uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, April 9, 1865 is the end of the Civil War. Uh, Lincoln, as we know, doesn't get to enjoy the victory. He is assassinated just a few days later. Um, you know, we'll actually talk about that more in the next chapter. I do want to talk about, though, even before the war is over, the process of rebuilding had begun. And this rebuilding of the United States after the Civil War is going to be known as Reconstruction. Uh, and we will see that Reconstruction, there's actually a, a couple of different ways, and we'll talk about Reconstruction extensively in the next chapter, uh, but I kind of wanted to, to give an intro to it at the end of this chapter. Um, Reconstruction takes several different uh, flavors. They, they try several different strategies uh, for rebuilding the South. The first experiment we'll see will be on the Sea Islands of South Carolina. Uh, the Sea Islands are actually going to be captured very early in the war by the Union Navy. Um, what happened was the Southerners fled, leaving everything behind, including their slaves. And we will see that Northerners came in, they, they buy up the land, and they will turn around and hire the slaves as hired labor, you know, proving, you know, attempting to prove that free labor ideology that if you hire people to work, they'll be more efficient, uh, they'll be more invested because they know that the harder they work, the more money they will earn. So they, they come in and they hire the slaves as workers to prove that, yes, life, you know, it, it's better for everyone all around if you hire them as workers rather than keep them as slaves. And it does. Um, it, it's pretty much a success for the freed slaves, even though they don't get what they really want. What they really want is land. Uh, the freed slaves don't necessarily want to work as hired workers. Uh, they, they want land of their own to run their own farms. So even though they don't get that, it is still pretty much a, a success for uh, the freed slaves. But we will see a very different kind of reconstruction in Louisiana. Uh, it's run by the military. Um, it, Louisiana is put under martial law, uh, and nobody's really happy. And so we're, we're going to see, and we'll talk about this again next chapter, some very conflicting ideas about what to do about the South after the Civil War is over, because, you know, uh, are we going to welcome them back in with open arms? Are we going to punish the South? Are we going to try to change the South? All these questions have to be answered. Um, in order to bring the southern states back into the, the Union fold. And these are some very difficult questions to answer, and we will see that nobody has the answer. Um, there are lots of different attempts. There are three or four different plans for Reconstruction, and none of them just knock it out of the park. None of them are, are accepted with open arms by either northerners or southerners. Uh, but that will 